Dear Heavenly Father, again, we just come before you in thankfulness that you gave us your word that we can learn and we can draw closer to you and we can spend that time with you for you are the living word, Jesus. And we thank you that we can read it and we can pray it and we can live it and you're there to help us meet us. And now as we open your word once again, open our minds, Holy Spirit, come and fill this place, fill us with your spirit. Help us to understand the words that we're about to read. And may the words that come out of my mouth be inspired by you, not by me or my flesh, but may we all learn something today from you. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So here at Buckingham Community Church, we just teach through the Bible, verse by verse. So we are in the book of Matthew. If you want to open your Bibles to chapter 23, and this is the first part of chapter 23. So, last time in chapter 22, if you remember, we watched Jesus being tested, right? God's Passover lamb was inspected for flaws or blemishes before he goes to the cross and is sacrificed for all of us. The three groups that came to to test him, his enemies, if you will, wanted to discredit him through his words. But they couldn't do it. They failed. It didn't go very well for the religious leaders. But now, Jesus starts talking to the people. You know, he just had this confrontation with the religious leaders in the temple. And then he asked them questions, and they failed that. And now he starts his last sermon, his last public teaching before he goes to the cross. So if you remember back to the first sermon Jesus taught, it was the Sermon on the Mount, if you remember that. And it was filled with what we call beatitudes, right? Or blessings. Blessed are the meek, blessed are these, blessed are those. And we're going to go through those because it's it's a neat contrast between what's coming up in this sermon versus that one. Because this one is full of woes, which we will see as we get into it. And Jesus pronounces eight woes on the religious leaders and the people like them. We're not going to get to all of them today, but we'll get to a good majority. So, how did Jesus begin his public ministry? He pronounced eight blessings in the form of Beatitudes. So, let's watch and see how those eight woes at the end correlate perfectly with the eight blessings from the beginning of his ministry. And it made me think, you know, this contrast is like, Like Jesus, we, while witnessing to people, should use that a little bit, you know. You you start off telling people the good news. Jesus loves you. God loves you. There's forgiveness. God is full of grace and mercy. He can change your life if you let him. The good news, the gospel, you start off with that. But some people are hard-headed, right? And they don't respond well to good news. Well, that's good and all, but, you know, and they just keep rejecting God. They reject the good news. Like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians and the scribes that Jesus confronted in the last chapter. Sometimes we must turn like Jesus is going to do now. I mean, the, the, the Pharisees saw all these wonderful things happening, but they still rejected him. But sometimes we must share the harsh truth that without Christ, you're doomed to be separated from God for eternity. And what is that? Well, God is light. God is love. God is mercy, grace, kindness, goodness. So if you're separated from God for all eternity, what does that leave? It leaves judgment, darkness, 
You know, he talks about being cast out into outer darkness where there's wailing and gnashing of teeth. And then eventually the lake of fire. And if that harshness, you know, doesn't wake you up, I don't know what, you know, it's your choice. Anyway, let's jump in and learn some stuff, yeah? Open your Bibles with me to Matthew 23, and we're going to start in verse 1. <laughs> then Jesus spoke to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. So this is a learning moment for the disciples and the crowd, and a serious rebuke for the scribes and the Pharisees. So we have this multi thing going on. So what does it mean he was sitting in Moses' seat, or all of these, you know? They had the, the power and the authority in the temple, right? So they have the authority, and they're teaching the word of God, but they're not living it. So they're misusing the power. They're laying heavy burdens on you. Be like me coming up here and say, you guys got to do all the work, and I'm just going to sit up here and be me. That's not how it works, though, right? Jesus tells the people to do as they do, as they say, not as they do, right? They say what's right. They know the laws of Moses, and they know what you're supposed to do, but they themselves don't do it. They have the right content, <laughs> but they don't have the right conduct. So we do need to do God's will. You need to read the Bible, understand what it means for you in your life, apply it to your life, and live it accordingly. I mean, that's really what he's saying. He's saying, listen to it. these guys. They're telling you what to do, and that's correct. But don't look at how they live it because they're not living what they're preaching. You know, so. And load you up with heavy laws and regulations, weighing down the people with legalism. You know, you obey the minutest, you, you know. But they won't help carry the load. Verse 5 continues. But all their works they do to be seen by men. You get your reward from men, that's, you know, it's like getting paid down here when, you, you know, when you're rewarded by heaven, by God. It's a big difference. You know, but it's inevitable that we're seen by people when we do things. I mean, I stand up here and you see me, you know, but I'm, that's not my purpose. My purpose is to teach you the word of God so that you can grow closer to God, you can grow stronger as a Christian and as a person and live this life better. These guys crave being seen by men. They crave it. They, you know, it's like they need to feel important in your eyes. But, you know, like I said, it's hard not to contrast myself because of my role here with them because of their role, you know. I've been given authority here by God as pastor, but I still struggle with that. I still struggle with the title pastor because I'm here just to serve. I'm here to study the Bible and bring you along for the ride. <sighs> But these unbelieving leaders do all kinds of things to make the people think they are more spiritual than they are. Like, continuing in verse 5, they make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. <laughs> Does that make sense to you? Anyway, you know what a phylactery is? 
It's a box that they tie to their head. Back in the Old Testament, Moses pretty much commanded them, right, strap the word of God on your head and on your hands. So they had these little boxes they call phylacteries, and they would put scripture inside these little boxes, and they would tie them to their head, so they would wear like a little box. And they would strap them to their wrist. So what would these guys do to impress you? They would get bigger boxes. Go around, I got, I'm, I'm more spiritual than you. See how big my box is? I can carry the whole Torah in this thing. Doesn't that make me more spiritual? And they would make bigger and broader to be seen more important. Bigger and broader. And, oh. <laughs> they have minds bigger than yours. And they'd make their garments more spiritual too. It was also a command for Moses that they had tassels hanging off the, the corners of their garments. But the purpose of those tassels was to remind them of heaven and to pray. But since I'm more heavenly minded and I can pray better than all of you, my tassels are twice as long and big and fat. It's a mindset, right? It's just a game they play on the outside. So they make the boxes bigger and the tassels longer to show they are more spiritual. But they also love, in verse 6, they love the best places at feasts. Sit me at the head of the table, please. The best seats in the synagogue. Greetings in the marketplace and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Oh, your phylactery is fabulous. They love to be recognized. Please seat me in the front. Set me at the head of the table, right up front in the synagogue, because I'm important. Oh, Rabbi, Rabbi, you're so special. How they love their titles. Do you know anybody that just loves their titles? Sometimes it's annoying, and that's my opinion, of course, then. Then Jesus turns from the rebuke of the leaders to the crowd in verse 8. But you do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teacher, for one is your teacher, the Christ. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. So basically, Jesus is saying, don't seek titles for the sake of self-exaltation. Right? I mean, I have a title, and you can use it. You can call me Pastor Jim, or you can just call me Jim. I don't really need you to call me Pastor Jim. But the idea is that if you are looking to have people use your title for self-exaltation, then you are putting yourself in a higher place than God. Don't do that. Don't look to be honored yourself, but look to honor God. You know, putting these teachings together... Technically, I'm not the teacher. I sit all week and study, and I hear from God, and I write down what he tells me. And I think it through, and I talk to him, and I pray, and I learn. So he's the teacher. I am the mouthpiece. And if that ever changes, throw things at me. If I start saying stuff that doesn't line up with Scripture... Please, stand up and say, Jim. No. Don't be called father. You know, it always makes me think of the Catholic Church. Why do the Catholic Church have fathers? Their priests are called father. And what is their purpose? 
but to be an intermediary between man and God. You go to confession, you confess your sins to the priest, who then, you know, I would never been a Catholic, so it's all secondhand information for me. He tells you to, to do penance and stuff like that. But Jesus tells us to go to him. He is our intermediary. We don't need a man in between us and God. We go directly to God. We don't need a father between us. God is the father. And I can enter his throne room and sit in his lap and hug him and say, Dad, I messed up. He's Abba, Father. Titles, it just gets in the way. Go to Jesus. Another title that really pops up is Reverend. That always annoys me. <laughs> and I have listened to people who call themselves Reverend, and I think, you know, most of the time they're a little bit off the mark. And they tend to put themselves above others and have kind of a haughty attitude. It's an elevated title. Never call me reverend or I might throw things at you. So, pastor, I am a pastor and, you know, I know I'm going to talk about myself a lot today, not in a so you can see me thing, but just to understand my role. Pastor, meaning one who ministers or serves the flock. Originally, it was a term shepherd. I'm your shepherd. And what does a shepherd do? He leads the flock to eat. Right? I lead you to eat the word of God, the bread of life. And once a month, I lead you to potlucks. Oh, come on. That was a good one. You guys can lighten up. I, I know it's Sunday, but humble yourselves. The greatest among you is your servant. So that's the only thing I like about my title is pastor, meaning shepherd, meaning servant, leader to eat, or lead everybody to eat. The word of God, mostly important. But you don't have to call me that, you know. You can, but you don't have to. The title is not why I am here. I feel like I'm just another one of you. This is just the position God has put me in. And you all have your positions here. And that's between you and God. And if you can't figure it out, come talk to me. We can pray about it and see, you know. And just because, you know, you say that, you have a talent, it doesn't necessarily come out in service during the Sunday mornings. Maybe it's service to your neighborhood in some way or the community around us. I don't know what your giftings are, but you should find out what God has called you to do in his kingdom and do it. If that's evangelism, you go down to the beach and witness to people, you should be doing that. You know, we're still a pretty small church, so we don't have a lot of programs to tie, but God is looking for a few good people to step up and get things started. You know, I mean, my role here is to teach you what the Bible says so you can draw closer to God and live life better. Because when you're obedient to God's word, you get blessed by God. I want you to draw closer to Jesus and the Father and be filled with the Spirit. You know, the world says greatness is measured by how many people serve you. How many employees do I have under my control? No. Jesus says your worth in the kingdom of God is how many people you serve. That's why I want this church to grow so I can serve more people and grow in the kingdom of God and have more treasure in heaven. That's my motivation. 
We must serve with the mindset of, I will serve to benefit others, not the mindset of, I will serve so others will notice me. You know, what a servant I am. Look, and definitely don't serve with the attitude of, I'm going to serve because I'm afraid of what people think of me if I don't serve. If I don't do it, think people might think bad, you know. If I don't show up on work days. <laughs> so, like again, find out what God has called you to do and step up. Just be part of the kingdom of God and serve him or whatever. Just give of yourself. Jesus says the true spiritual leader does two things. He avoids elevated titles and he accepts lowly tasks. Right? So we're humble and we serve. Jesus himself was an awesome example of this, right? He avoided the titles and honors that people wanted all through his ministry over the last th three years of his ministry. When, while we're reading this, he's in the last week of his life before he goes to the cross. But he didn't. He said, shh, don't tell anybody. He humbled himself. He chose instead to eat with sinners, to wash people's feet, to touch le lepers and to heal people, to serve, right? Jesus is the ultimate spiritual leader. So now back to the bad guys. And Jesus starts with the woes. Here we go, you ready? Verse 13. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against me. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in against men. Sorry. <laughs> Their traditions, right? Their lack of belief. It becomes an obstacle to others. They're basically teaching them how to reject Messiah. A hypocrite, I know you all know what it is, but is a person that has one standard for you, but lives a different way themselves. They have different rules. They judge you harshly, but they don't judge themselves at all. You know anybody like that? They're two-faced People who say they're Christians, but really aren't. You know, you say, well, I'm a Christian, but over here, you live like the world when you go home. They don't live biblically at all. So that's the first woe. Contrast that with the first beatitude, Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So the Pharisees were proud of spirit. They would pray and thank God that they were not like other men. <laughs> I love that. Luke 18, 11 gives us one of these prayers. The Pharisees stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this taxpayer. Can you imagine praying like that? Oh, I'm glad I'm not like you. If I prayed like that, you'd all leave, right? <laughs> I would. Anyway, the pride of the Pharisees will keep them out of the kingdom while the poor in spirit will go in. The next one, four, uh, verse 14. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you devour widows, houses, widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore you, therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. So in contrast, the next beatitude is, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. So Jesus has promised that the mourners would be comforted. The Pharisees, however... 
manipulated these who mourn. So if a man died, leaving a widow, the Pharisees and Sadducees would go to them. And I'm going to paraphrase a little. Say, if you donate to my ministry, give me some money, I will pray for you. And it will be a long, beautiful prayer. But if they don't give you money, then, you know. So they extort them. They should just go and minister to them. Bring them food and comfort and prayer without asking for a donation. And we see that all over the place today, right? If you give me $1,000, I will pray for you and you'll be healed. Or your bank account will be filled. Because I can name it and claim it and bam. Bam. You can get rich. If you give me $1,000, I'll pray for you. There's a lot of ministries that work that way. Let's pass the plate twice today because we want an extra blessing for you. Verse 15 is the next one. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte. And when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Contrast that to blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Matthew 5, 5. The meek were to inherit the earth. The Pharisees, on the other hand, were trying to convert the earth to their legalistic, legalistic hypocritical religious system. The tragedy is that when a legalist lays his trip on someone, what happens? The student becomes more, bigger, better, right? My phylactery is bigger than yours because I want to outdo my teacher, right? My tassels are twice as long as yours. <laughs> They become more zealous, more religious, more legalistic. It's tragic. Verse 16. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold in the temple, he is obligated to perform it. Fools and blind For which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is obligated to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Therefore, he who swears by the altar, swears by it and by all things on it. He who swears by the temple, swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven, swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. So the contrasting beatitude, Matthew 5, 6 Says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for integrity, for truth and simplicity. The Pharisees weren't hungering for righteousness. They're twisting the truth, right? They're playing games with phrases. with semantics and vocabulary. The scribes and the Pharisees had a practice of making promises they didn't have to keep. Well, this is a a promise that I'm making to you. I don't really want to keep it. I'm going to swear by the, the temple, but not the gold. So I don't really have to keep that. That's what they're saying. But, well, if I really want to keep this promise, I'll swear by the gold in the temple. Let's see, they've got it backwards. 
They don't have to keep it. They knew it. They were. They wanted to keep this promise. They don't want to keep that promise. But if you swear by the temple, it's not as binding as if you swear by the gold in it. You know, one promise you can break, another one you don't. You can't. Jesus is saying, what is more important, the temple or the gold? The temple. These guys are fit, placing the physical above the spiritual, right? The gold above the temple. Gold more important than God. Because God indwells the temple. The gold is just something that's in there too. Or the offering on the altar. It's a thing. They're saying that is important. It's not. The altar that sanctifies it is. The, the temple and the altar represent God. Whereas the gold and the gifts are not. They're just gifts to God. Which one's more important? The gift to God or God himself? See, they've got it mixed up. It's backwards. Like today's society, right? Right is wrong and wrong is right. Light is dark and dark is light. You can go loot a store and it's okay because the world owes it to you because your ancestors were slaves. I'm not trying to get racist. I believe there's one race. It's called the human race, and we're all in it together. So racist, racism is just a religion that people have made up. That's my belief. You can take it or leave it. But the world is upside down like them. What's more important? It's just another way to make promises you don't intend to keep. The Bible says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Mean what you say. Live by your word. If you say you're a Christian, live like it. If you don't live like it, don't say you're one. Why does Christianity have such a bad name? Because so many people out there use Christianity to get money out of your pockets. Yes, we take your we receive your tithes and offerings to pay the bills. But I mean, I don't take a salary. I do this to serve God and to serve you. I'm hoping someday that I could do this full time and have a salary and quit my goat farming. It's a lot of hard work, and I would rather just study the word and be around for you guys. But that's in the future. We're not there yet. But even when I get a paycheck, it's going to be reasonable. Pastors that take millions of dollars a year is ridiculous. Why does one person need millions of dollars per year for pastoring a church? Just blows my mind. Anyway, rabbit trail. Woo. Verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. Justice and mercy and faith, these you ought to have done without leaving the other undone. <laughs> That's interesting, isn't it? Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Matthew 5, 7 says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. According to Leviticus 11, the largest unclean animal listed was a camel, and the smallest was a gnat. Just thought I'd throw that in there. Jesus said the Pharisees picked gnats out of their soup, right? They strained it and didn't want to swallow a gnat because it was against the law of Moses to drink the blood or eat meat with blood in it. So if you're swallowing a gnat, that's the whole body, blood and all, and they go, Ugh. but Jesus is like, what, you're overlooking the camel that you're swallowing whole. You missed the big picture. They had all the little details down pat, right? 
but they've missed the big picture of love and faith and mercy and righteousness. Tithing is not just an Old Testament practice. I mean, Jesus talks about it here. Jesus brings it into the New Testament as well. Jesus is saying we should practice justice and mercy and faith, but not neglect the other. And he started off talking about tithing. The other is tithing. We do need to practice the more important things above and beyond that. We need to have be just with each other and merciful towards each other. We must have faith. But we still shouldn't forget the other things. But you got to do it with the right heart, the right intent. You know, the heart is more important than duty, than serving. You need to get your hearts right, and then when you serve, you're serving for the right reason. And these guys, you know, it was all about a tenth of that was tithing in the Old Testament. So these guys, the Pharisees, would count out their mint seeds, and their anus seeds, and their cumin seeds. One for me, or one for God, and nine for me. Aren't we so spiritual and awesome? Look how I do the tenth down to the seed. One for God, nine for me. Methodical and legalistic. Jesus is asking, where is your heart in this practice? Yes, you're giving their tithes a tenth of what you do, but you do it in a way to show off to men. We need to pay tithes out of worship, not out of obligation. I believe in the New Testament, Jesus tends to take everything to a higher level. Adultery isn't anymore just actually doing the act of having a relation outside your marriage. Adultery is having thoughts of doing it. Murder isn't the act of killing somebody as much as, that is, but hating your brother. Hatred towards somebody is equal to murder. I know that's an extreme example, but tithing, the same thing. You do it out of how blessed has God blessed you? How much has God blessed you? We give out of worship to God. If you don't give a tenth, that's fine. You can give 20 or 30 percent. It's okay. <laughs> okay. They are blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. They miss the big picture. They are trying to keep the law down to the most minute detail, but don't realize they are neglecting the huge, important things, mercy, grace, love, justice, faith. Oh, I know I'm repeating it over, but the Bible repeats it over too. So, You know, legalism blinds you to the bigger picture of loving others. Legalism, you know, kind of tends to focus you on things that, don't matter as much. The church I grew up in, it was, you know, if you didn't put on your Sunday best and, you know, your suit and tie and look all fancy, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness. And if you're not there, you don't come through the doors. You know, they had all the, they were focusing on all the don't, 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 don't. Don't do this, don't do that. Focus on this, focus on that. Don't, don't do this. Don't. But I have found a key to life is that if you focus on the do's, you don't do the don'ts. Focus on what God says. Focus on God's word. Focus on your relationship with Jesus Christ. Focus on the do's. Show up to church. Show up to people's houses when they need help. Feed each other in prayer, in words. Study the Bible together. Just hang out and play cards together. Share meals. Get all in each other's lives. You do the do's and you don't do the don'ts. That's living. You want to overcome 
addictions and all of that. Stop focusing on it. Focus on God. Focus on God's word. Focus on Christians. That seems simplistic. But a relationship with God is simple. We're messed up. He's not. He loves us. Think about that. Simple. Believe him. Believe in him. Accept it. Verse 25. I might run just a little long today, but I'm almost there. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. Matthew 5, 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The, pure, the purity of the true believer enables him to see God. So if you're honest and true, want to seek after righteousness, you can see God. But the hypocrisy of the Pharisees blinds him to the things of God. They've got Messiah standing right before them and they can't see it. Jesus is talking about their hearts. You clean the outside, you put the big box on your head and you have the long tassels and you got the fancy robes and you got the long fancy prayers and you got the best seats in the house. But inside <laughs> is ugly. Clean up your heart, clean up your inside first and then the outside will be clean too. If you're truthful and honest and your yes is yes and your no is no and you love God and you're seeking after righteousness and applying his word to your life, it will show. It's not about the size of the box on your head or the length of your tassels. <laughs> it's about living God's way. It's about loving God and loving others. Clean up your hearts and minds and people will see God in you and you will see God yourself. That's way more impressive than putting on an act. I mean, just the thought of these guys walking around with these massive boxes and long tassels and being all holier than thou and long lofty prayers that really don't say much. I've heard people pray like that and it's like, are we done yet? All right, so I didn't go over that long. But we're going to stop here for now. I know we have a few more woes that we'll catch next week, and then we'll get into chapter 24, which some of you might be pretty excited about 24 coming up. It's a lot of end-time prophecy stuff that Jesus talks about, so that's coming up starting next week. Dear Lord, again, we come before you in awe and wonder. Thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. Thank you for making a way for us to come to you and have a relationship with you. Guide us now as we go our ways. Bless us according to your abundance. Fill us with your wisdom and give us insight and understanding as we go. Help us all to know how to serve you and to serve others as we live in your kingdom, even though we're amongst the world, we're not of the world. Just help us to know that, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So remember, next week is potluck. Remember, we just bring food to service. We have it back there, put it in a crock pot, or we have a fridge if it needs to stay.